some of what people have said before, but I think these are things that need to be repeated. So I don't feel uh, bad about it. Um, okay, so, so what's this talk about? So um, it's a talk about logic um, because I guess most of us are interested in logic, but it's also a talk about something more important than logic. So of course we all know Tony as a mathematician and there've been lots of talks and uh, lots of stories about how inspirational she is and how her work is. Um, but when I think of Tony, I also think of um, the personal aspect and her qualities as a person and her sort of emotional intelligence, which allows her to work with people with so many different abilities, um, levels of experience, personalities, and so on, which I think is quite extraordinary. Um, and the way she has of bridging the gap of being sort of sensitive and empathetic to the person behind the mathematician. Um, so I think that's, that's something really special. She meets people on equal terms. Um, so um, she almost always knows more than one does, but you never get the sense from talking to her. There's always a sense that one has something to contribute in a discussion. Um, so I think that's a very special skill as well, that there's no sense of hierarchy in working with her. So, um, so, so these are all sort of important things. And for me, her mathematical work is sort of interwoven with these sort of personal qualities. So I'm going to try to capture at least a little bit of that in my talk um, without separating the two out completely. So let's see how it goes. Um, so, okay, so when I say a theory of Tony C.S., what is a theory? So I'd like it to mean any and or all of these things. So theory is, of course, what we all practice in a manner of speaking, because we're theoretical computer scientists. I mean, there's sort of like the dictionary definition where it's some sort of system of ideas intended to explain something. I mean, I don't think I can really explain Tony and her, her work, but I can at least try to sort of organize what um, my experience of it is. And, and then there's, of course, a logical definition of a theory. Uh, which came up when there's a sort of boundary arithmetic reading group here at Simons and, and Tony was talking. I mean, there's this whole discussion of whether a theory is a set of sen sentences or you also need it to be close on logical consequence. I think I like the definition as just a set of sentences because it makes being a theorist easier. And I think, <laughs> I think I can live up to it more easily in this talk. So just think of this talk as a set of sentences and we'll be fine. Um, okay, so, so what am I going to do? So I only have half an hour, so I don't have that much time. So um, the way this talk is going to organize is through just some basic concepts that you might all be aware of, um, familiar with, and maybe to see these in a somewhat new light. So we're talking about completeness, induction, models, proofs, relations. So completeness first. Um, so we heard earlier in this workshop, Noriko's talk, she um, uh, was uh, asking about Tony's favorite mathematical theorem. And um, yeah, we heard that Tony's favorite mathematical theorem is a completeness theorem for first order logic. But then the question arises, what does this say about her and her career? Um, well, it says something about her can-do attitude, I guess, that anything that's true can be proven. Um, <laughs> and, and, and my favorite theorem is the incompleteness theorem, and you can infer what it says about me. <laughs> but, but, but this is going to be about Tony. Um, so uh, I, I went back and I looked at Tony's work, and I was trying to like draw together various themes. So, so um, like if you look at her kind of like research program and her career, um, um, for, from now, I mean, like, what's, uh, what sort of themes emerge? And, and, and there are several that sort of come up. And first, of course, are these sort of long-term research <coughs> programs. So the, the kind of the questions that Tony kind of like learned about when she was a graduate student, the question I see in Fundamental then, she's been concerned with ever since, right? So the, the project of proving proof complexity low bounds for a variety of systems, for variants of resolution, cutting planes, Nostranzads with Paul and Russell and others, bounded Frege, Loa Schreiber, stabbing planes. So um, this sort of um, like project of proving low bounds for proof complexity, which is a fundamental problem, has been something that's occupied all along. And then there's a the theme of automatability, which we heard about in Maria's talk. Uh, so there's a sort of seminal paper of Krychek and Pudlak, but then several of the following works by Maria and Tony and others on TC0 Fregger, bounded depth Fregger, with his work with Sam and others on MP hardness of proof size, which is closely related. Then Tony's really cool work on connections between learnability and automatability, which hasn't really been followed up very much, but I think it's a really cool connection. Then following on Albert's work with Eliza Maneva, some, some work on weak automatability of depth three Frege. More recently, following that serious Muller paper on algebraic systems cutting planes, you can see that, um, that once Tony gets onto a problem, she thinks about it for years, for decades on end, and kind of like remains engaged with it because these are fundamental problems. And she's interested in the hard problems, the fundamental problems. And then of course there's lifting, which I'm not as qualified to talk about, but you heard about some of that from Paul's talk, um, starting with a paper with Paul and Trin. I mean, there's a sort of vast theory of lifting that she's developed with Mika and Robert and others. Um, so there's a lot in proof chemistry we don't understand, but at least for the things that we do understand, we can try to understand it really, really well and to kind of 
uh, make this really rich map of connections between queries and communication between circuits and proofs and so on. So it's a really beautiful theory. So there's all of these things, but it's not just that. I mean, Tony's always open to bridging um, with uh, people that she comes into contact with and with working with them. So in particular, I mean, things that I'm aware of collaborations with Toronto postdocs, uh, such as Arkadev. I mean, Arkadev came in, an interest in communication complexity. It's something that Tony worked with him on. Josh Grocha told us about um, how he was interested in algebraic complexity, and then Tony met him halfway with that. And I was more interested in structural complexity and computational complexity, and that's kind of what we kind of like um, worked on together. And there's always a sense, I mean, of course, it's about including us and about connecting to us, but it's also about somehow expanding proof complexity because then these tools, these ideas come into proof complexity and make proof complexity a richer and, um, and, and, and more significant field, I think. So, um, so, so this serves multiple purposes. And then there are other explorations which I can't really like um, capture within this. I mean, so maybe a sense of adventure, differential privacy with Cynthia and her work with Rich and fairness and theory of machine learning. Um, maybe somewhere in Tony said these are connected proof complexity too. I don't know, but, uh, but uh, yeah, but, it's, um, but, but, but I think it's just um, very useful for, uh, for someone who's starting off to think about like the various ways in which you can kind of like form a research vision and, and um, kind of a combination of like a longer term research program questions that you care about all the way through and then opportunities that you have in terms of meeting people halfway and connecting with them. Um, and then trying to keep things fresh and interesting for yourself and um, having these kind of maybe intellectual adventures or that's what I think of them as at least. So, uh, so that's about completeness. Um, so induction is next. Um, and this is gonna be a bit more personal because it's gonna be about my own induction to proof complexity at Toronto. <laughs> um, so, um, so what happened was that I arrived in Toronto as a postdoc in 2007. I'd done a PhD at Chicago and then I was uh, with Valentin um, at Simon Fraser for a bit, at uh, the same time as Josh Boresh Oppenheim. And I'd only been doing computational complexity. I, hadn't, uh, I didn't have a clue about proof complexity. So that's the, um, so when, when I arrived in Toronto, I mean, there's this like great theory group at Toronto. I imagine working mostly with Steve and with Charlie Rakoff. Um, I did work a bit with Steve and that led, I think eventually to this windfall that, uh, that James and Ian have, the hundred dollar windfall. But um, so, so, so there's some work in that direction. I talked a lot to Charlie, but not the easiest person to collaborate with, but I enjoyed the conversations with him. Uh, in the end, it was Tony who had the most influence on me and my work. Um, so what she did was that she suggested that I use my intuitions about computational complexity as a guide when learning and doing proof complexity. Um, and like th there was a sort of um, this thing mentioned earlier in the workshop about how the first problem you meet sort of imprints you, right? So like, like somehow you, you continue thinking about it all the way along. And it's been like that with my first experience of proof complexity, this idea of connections between circuit complexity, computational complexity and proof complexity, has been something that's concerned me ever since. Um, and I think that's because of this kind of initial sort of interaction with Tony. Um, and let me just say a little bit about what we did. So our first kind of paper together, this was when I was still a postdoc at Toronto or immediately afterward. Um, so we kind of like tried to define like a new notion of simulation and proof complexity, which was actually heavily influenced by work of Pavel and, and, and Maria and Albert. So the standard notion of a simulation proof complexity is where a system A simulates a system B for every formula. Um, there's some polynomial time algorithm that maps B proofs to A proofs, right? So in particular, if there's a short B proof, there's also gonna be a short A proof because this polynomial time algorithm will output a proof of size polynomial in the size of this B proof. Um, so that's the standard notion of simulation. And then one of the fundamental questions of proof complexity is for various pairs of proof systems, does one simulate the other or not? So Sam talked about Frege versus EF. I mean, are there even good candidates for, 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 can, for formulas that are uh, short proofs in EF, but not in Frege? So does Frege P simulate EF? That's one of the big questions in our field. Um, so for most natural pairs of proof systems, A and B, um, let's say that B is at least as strong as A, it simulates A. It seems likely that A doesn't simulate B. As long as we haven't found a simulation so far, maybe there is a separation. But as we well know, if you try to prove proof complexity low bounds, it's often very hard to show. So what we did was, well, I mean, the typical kind of theorist strategy with a hard question, right? Change the question. So we considered a sort of relaxed notion of simulation. Um, and we have this notion of an effective P simulation, which is somehow makes more sense from the point of view of computational complexity, which is that um, you don't really require that every formula in B has like short proofs in A. All you require is that for every formula in B, there's some other formula in A that A has short proofs of that's sort of like equivalent to the original B formula, right? So there's like an efficient truth preserving algorithm, which means that it maps like tautologies to tautologies and non-tautologies to non-tautologies. 
such that when M is at least the size of shortest B proof of phi, that's kind of like a sl slight technical condition. Let's not worry about that for now. Then R of phi comma M is an A proof of A. So you're allowed to somehow pre-process this formula phi or change it. And then you're allowed to prove that in A instead. So um, essentially what A needs to do is just to prove a formula that's equivalent to phi efficiently rather than phi itself. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so it's not that natural from the point of view of proofs perhaps, but it is natural from the point of view of proof search because from the point of view of proof search and looking for proofs, this kind of simulation is sufficient. It's um, if A has efficient proof search and uh, A effectively P simulates B, then B has efficient proof search as well. Um, and we gave several examples of non-trivial effect of P simulations, linear resolution and resolution, resolution and K resolution and clause learning and resolution and so on. So this is a setting in which it's possible to get simulations where you can't get simulations, but we don't know how to get simulations in the standard setting. Um, well, and, and then we can ask about the low bound question. Can we hope to shape, show that A does not effectively simulate B for systems A and B? Um, and there's kind of like a simple proposition that if NP equals P, then every pair of proof systems, uh, A effectively P simulates B. So what does this mean? This means now that we have a good excuse for not being able to show low bounds because that would separate NP and P. So we win both ways. Simulations are kind of richer. And uh, as for the impossibility of simulations, that's harder to prove. So we don't need to worry about it. Um, we can, however, still hope for separations under restricted form of reductions. And I think that's something that's interesting that maybe there can be further work on. So this is my kind of like first work with Tony. I mean, yeah, it's um, I mean, mostly observations, it's a, but it's, it's really something that kind of brought me to proof complexity and got me more familiar with the notion. So uh, that's, that was my introduction to proof complexity. Okay, then uh, the notion of a model. So that's a third concept. Um, and of course, what I'd like to talk about is Tony's role model. So, um, um, so yeah, it, from a variety of points of view, um, so from the point of view of sociality, so um, yeah, one of the most exciting things for me um, coming to Toronto is that there's so many people to talk to there. Um, so, I mean, at Simon Fraser, I had one team to talk to and that was great. At Chicago, I learned how to talk to nobody um, because uh, you're expected to be self-reliant there. And at Toronto, it's a complete opposite. You learn how to talk to everybody. And somehow by interpolating between these, you learn to be somewhat social as a researcher. <laughs> so I think it's good to be in different environments and kind of, um, and, and learn different skills. And for those of you who are students here at Simons, I mean, Simons is a naturally social place. So I'd really urge you to take advantage of that fully. Uh, and I think a big part of the sociality at Toronto was Tony because she and Amner were like really like hubs um, of the, I mean, um, the, the, I mean, a group that had been built up by Alan and Steve, but then Tony and Avna were very, very active in interacting with students and postdocs. And there's a really great atmosphere. I mean, we were in the Sanford Fleming building, which is not the most inspiring place, but it was a great place to, <laughs> to be in because of the people there. Yeah, Russell. So is the uh, social sociality does that have the same relation to social ability? as automatizability <laughs> as to automatizability. That's a controversial question, just judging by everything that's happened so far. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so sociality, sociability, yeah. Uh, I think that's gonna be a hard one to decide too. <laughs> um, okay, the second thing um, is multitasking because um, like ever since I've known Tony, she's been great at like making time for her students and for postdocs, but she's always had a lot on her plate. Um, and I think like the, the older I get, the more senior I get, the more I understand why this is the case. But it's sort of like inspirational how in the time that she had, she was able to use it to the max and, and kind of like um, in kind of communicating ideas and directions and so forth. I mean, maybe kind of writing a paper on a drive on the highway is a bit extreme, but otherwise I think the multitasking <laughs> is a good idea. Um, and then uh, of course Rahul, can, I, uh, can I add to that? Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say kind of one of the things that amazed me about Tony's multitasking is that when she is meeting with you, you don't feel like she's multitasking. You don't realize that she has a dozen other things going on the rest of her day. Like it feels like, oh, yeah, she's been working on your project the whole time. Right. And yet somehow she has like dozens of things going on at once. And it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when Tony is with you, she's completely present. And I think that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the, 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 the nicest aspects. I mean, in terms of the sociality or sociability, for example, I, like, I, I mean, I know that Tony isn't naturally the most extroverted person, and yet she manages to be quite social. So that's kind of like a model for me, because I, I think I'm quite introverted, too, in some ways. So um, it's, uh, yeah, but, but the, the main thing is to be completely present when you are with someone. And, and that Tony has always been in her research uh, conversations. Um, and then, of course, I mean, Tony's modesty. So you saw yesterday that she's very reluctant to talk about herself. 
Um, and that's sort of like genuine and comes from, from deep down, but it also has this other function that it means that she's never sort of complacent or rest, rest on her laurels. She's always about the next new problem or le like learning something new. And I think that's inspirational too, the sense that there's always something left to do um, and uh, one can't quite just um, sit back and be comfortable. And then finally, um, well, this is of course a term that less valiant popularized, but it, it has nothing to do with less's notion. So evolvability, and what do I mean by that? So I was thinking of something very specific, which is um, presentations. So this is a presentation. And um, uh, to be honest, I'm quite embarrassed in general by my presentations because, I mean, I'm not as harsh on myself as you all is, but let's say my presentations <laughs> are low tech. Let's, let's call them low tech to be polite. And um, for a long time, I was okay with this because Tony's presentations were low tech too. And I thought if, if, if that was the case with her, then they could, it was fine for it to be the case with me. And then a few years ago, she learned how to use the tablet and she's drawing like these beautiful pictures and giving these great talks. And I felt very abandoned, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but also inspired. Um, I mean, it's maybe not such a good idea for me to give talks on my tablet or if anyone wants to see my handwriting, but maybe there are other ways in which I could evolve. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's about um, being a role model. Uh, next, the notion of proof. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about real world proofs. And I don't mean ones that are done by SAT solvers, but ones that are done by us humans, proofs in our area. So of the three projects I've been involved with by, with Tony, by far the most labor intensive in many ways was this one of pseudo determinism, which um, was with Shafi and Russell and Tony. Um, and uh, it's a project, but I also think of it as a virus. and. Um, There's a mathematical virus that maybe I'd like to help spread uh, at, this, at, at this event. Um, already, Arka, they have said a bit about it. Um, and I, I think it, it might be good to just kind of repeat a little bit of the framework and then tell you some stories about what happened with this project. So, um, so what's your relative query complexity? So you have this, this question, there's a total search problem and an end with input. Um, let S be the search problem. And we say it has pseudo relative query complexity Q. There's a randomized query algorithm which makes at most Q queries and outputs a fixed solution to a search problem with a probability at least two thirds, let's say. Um, so one example, uh, I, th I think this isn't one that they've covered is output a 0.1 additive approximation to the fraction of ones in the input string, right? So this notion of pseudo determinism was a beautiful notion that Shafi and Iran Gart came up with, and then it's been studied in various contexts. And one of the things that's been proved about it in the query setting, there's this paper by Goldreich, Goldwasser and Ron, and they showed that this problem has um, pseudo to query complexity omega n. So it requires omega n complexity. I mean, it's easy to see just by random sampling that you can get um, kind of like an answer that's within point 0.1 just by making constant number of queries, but not the same answer each time. If you want to pr produce the same number with on most competition paths, that requires query complexity omega n. And that's a sort of a hybrid argument. So it's a nice argument, but it's not too hard to show. And then you might think, well, let's change the problem slightly. Um, and let's ask for this kind of like a solution to this find ones problem. So given an n-bit input with at least n over two ones, can you output the index of a one, right? So can you output the index of some one? And this is a problem that's an FNP in the query world. Uh, unlike the other problem, you can actually check the solution because if you're given an i, you can go and look at xi and check that it's actually one. There's something you can't do with that problem of approximating the Hamming weight. Um, so it's interesting to look at problems in FNP and whether you can separate randomized and zero terms to query complexity for this problem. Um, and the randomized query complexity is again O1 because you can just output a random index and that's likely to be good with high probability. Um, and the trivial exhaustive search algorithm um, is a deterministic algorithm which requires query complexity omega n, omega n because you might keep encountering zeros. You look at the string from beginning to end and you output the first one. And it seems hard to come up with a pseudo deterministic algorithm that does much better than that. I mean, that seems to be the best um, that, that we seem to be able to do. Um, so, um, well, what we showed, um, and this is again repeating what Arthur said, is that find once requires query complexity omega square root n. And there's a sort of a surprisingly indirect proof. I mean, it requires a detour through the notion of proof system, the application of Huang sensitivity theorem and so on. Well, the one saving grace is optimal for quantum query algorithms. So it's optimal for something, but it's not quite the bound you want to get. So what about the true omega n bound? So it's kind of like connected to this kind of graph theoretic problem that's very, very natural, right? So you consider like, a coloring of the middle two layers, say of the n cube, and you take a vertex and you color it by some i. So an arbitrary coloring such that a vertex colored by some i such that the i bit is one, right? So if you say you have like the first n o two bits are zeros, so the next n o two bits are ones, so the color can be any of the uh, n thing between n o two plus one and n n n, right? So that's an n coloring um, that we, the n coloring that we consider. And the question is, is there some vertex v in these middle two layers such that its neighborhood is omega of n colors? So the neighborhood is, is very polychromatic. Um, 
And we'd like to show that such a vertex exists. And if we do, then we would get um, a linear pseudo deterministic query uh, low bound. So, I mean, that seems that it should be the case. And uh, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but we, we just weren't able to prove it. And um, so maybe at this point, it helps to say a little bit about how uh, this problem was introduced to me and what happened after that. So um, it, this problem was actually, I mentioned to be Ofer Grossman, who's a student of Shafi's. And I think he had thought about it and it seemed very simple at first. And it was um, sort of like, he thought an information theoretic argument should do it, but it didn't really give him much. Oh yes. Do you mean this was introduced? This no, no, the uh, find ones, oh, okay. the find ones. Yeah, so Ofer visited me in 2018 and he talked to me about find ones and he said, there should be an information theoretic kind of like arguments for this, but we don't know, it's very surprising. I agree it was surprising. But I didn't get quite infected by the virus until I came here for the science program 2018. And then we talked with the Shafi and Tony and I talked about it. And um, we had some kind of progress towards it. I mean, independently, I think Russell had a way of combining like known kind of query sort of relations to get this n to the one fourth bound, which is also n to the one third or close to n to the one third. But then there's this question of trying to get closer to, um, to, to mega n. And at some point, I don't remember whether it was the end of the science program or maybe shortly afterward, there was this square root n argument. I think that was really due to Tony. Um, but then we were kind of like trying to work further on, on improving it. And I have all these emails in my inbox. I mean, like hundreds of them actually. We worked on it for months on end. Um, and Tony would send me all these ideas. We, we kind of like tried kind of graph theoretic methods and algebraic methods and Sperner's lemma and uh, the Fourier analytic methods and uh, yeah, every, yeah, everything that we could think of. And I'm still haunted by the idea that there's some, in one of those emails, there's an idea I didn't probably follow up that might have led to a solution, but um, yeah, but I don't know. But I think it's um, a really, really great problem. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to sacrifice yourself to be infected by this virus <laughs> and to settle it once and for all. Um, um, because I mean, like if you say their complexity theorists interested in complexity low bounds, it seems embarrassing that we can't prove this. Um, on the other hand, I mean, like Huang's um, sort of sensitivity theorem is like such a beautiful proof and it was only done recently. Maybe there's a similarly beautiful proof for this. Um, we need to wait and see. So there's this sort of like story earlier about the cyclin pathologies and how there's like this, this sort of um, enterprise for a very long time and trying to prove the low bound against cutting planes and it failed. But there was a good reason for that failing because it was false. But here it's probably true, so we don't have as good a reason. I think. <laughs> dangerous, dangerous, <laughs> dangerous. Don't say anything. <laughs> Try to refute it then. Well, one or the other. How do you one of the two? Um, okay, and finally about the the, the notion of a relation. Um, and I think here, um, yeah. So 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 many people in the proof complexity community and beyond. Tony is like a collaborator, mentor, and friend. Um, so yeah, that, that, and so it's so valuable in, in many different ways. Um, um, and she's perhaps, I mean, the, the most generous and enabling of collaborators I know. And I mean, given how collaborative she is and how influential her work has been in proof complexity, I, I, I was kind of like had this thought experiment of could we define like a Pitassi number for a search system proof complexity, a distance in the collaboration graph from her. Um, then I thought about it a bit and I was like, this isn't so interesting because suppose we pick a random paper on proof complexity <laughs> and a random author on this paper, the high probability the author will have potassium number at most one. And the not so probability they'll have potassium number zero. <laughs> so it's kind of like trivializes the notion and might not be so interesting to consider. So. <laughs> but uh, it's quite extraordinary how much Tony is able to connect to people and draw them into, into proof complexity. Um, and of course, she's been a very sort of valuable mentor and friend. It's harder to talk about because it's more personal, but she's always been present um, whenever uh, we needed her. I mean, also in organizing this program. Yeah, Russell? I think we could have like a competition where instead of people competing to have a low potassium number, you see like if anybody has a high one. <laughs> That's gonna be hard. Yeah, hard see, what is see. the diameter of the graph? Yeah. <laughs> That's a much better question. I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, so just to conclude, I mean, like, Thanks, Tony, for all your mathematical lessons and all your life lessons. And thanks for being a collaborator, for being a mentor, and most of all, for being a friend. What a great talk to wrap up on. Uh, any questions? Russell again? So I think I came in on, at least on the writing of that paper, when uh the work had already been done it didn't like really seem that uh 
I didn't spend that much of an effort on that paper <laughs> compared to other things. But I, but I, I want to say, but since then, like I like, spent, wasted a lot of time on this problem. Um, and I think it's like a general comment. Uh, and I think what you were saying agrees with it is that in my life, I've spent uh, a lot of effort in mathematics failing. Uh, and the ratio of time I've spent failing to time I've spent succeeding is immense. <laughs> so it's much more work to fail to solve a problem than to succeed. And I think you were saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I should say that with this mathematical virus, we did try to infect as many people as possible. We told Avi Wigdeson and Noga Alon and Mike Stacks about it, but they're very skilled at evading these viruses, so they didn't succumb. Yeah. But maybe, <laughs> maybe someone here will. Yeah. Thinking of one story, I don't know if I should say it. Uh, so uh, I don't know if, uh, so in uh, Toronto students, we had the theory student seminar, I think it's still running. And the rule was that faculty were only allowed the explicit invitation of uh, the speaker. I don't know if it's still the case. Yeah, but, uh, in my time at Toronto, I can't remember faculty ever being invited, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> so when Tony came and, uh, to Toronto and found about the theory student seminars, Says, but how can I? How can I not come? I still feel like a student. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> and for longest time, I think it was the only honorary student that was allowed. <laughs> I finally, like decided, all right, I better not. <laughs> <laughs> that explains why you see everybody's equal with particular stuff of the student. <laughs> well, it was fun, you know. It was that was so. I just wanted to thank the organizers and everybody for yeah, an amazing like three days yeah it was like really shocking and amazing so thanks so much yeah i guess on that uh let's thank rahul again and move to the closing remarks okay uh shafi do you have something you need to say or at the end oh, oh okay never mind <laughs> All right. Well, first, there has been uh, uh, before this intractable problem that has uh, been solved that I want to announce, which is uh, what is the afternoon activity? And uh, that we were planning on a hike originally, but then the, the weather hit. So we thought that we should keep our options open. And when we told this to Tony, of course, she wasn't deterred and said, oh, yeah, let's go on a hike. So at 2.30, we're going to meet in the lobby and then we're going to uh, walk somewhere. So uh, bring good uh, shoes and jacket and whatnot. Um, yeah, other evening things, uh, there will still be a music night at six o'clock tonight. And the will- Before thank you, Shafi. Oh yeah, wait, thank you, Shafi, so much for all your help. Yeah. Shafi has done a lot to the point of even offering us her house for the yesterday's party, but the weather interfered. And without you, we wouldn't have this part. Yes. Well, we wouldn't have the workshop to begin with. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. So yes, uh, there will also be people going to pub trivia at seven. A number of people have asked me about this. It will be at uh, Bobby G's Pizzeria, uh, which is at the corner of University and Shattuck. Uh, but um, there's also the there's the uh, night, before so. that. Uh, Music night, how many people would show up if you have it? Yay, okay, the music night's on. Perfect. All right, and now, of course, to the thanks. Uh, thank you for catching Shafi before she left. Uh, of course, first and foremost, it's uh, Simons for giving us the venue and the budget and everything for this incredible event. Uh, to the events and operations staff who have been dealing with us the whole time, Drew, Kevin, William, Ashley, Elizabeth, Sandy. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, and uh, yeah, the tech staff in general for making sure that all the uh, the mics and the Zoom and whatnot run smoothly. Uh, Shafi, of course, for offering your house and for helping with the banquet arrangements. Uh, Ellie for catering it yesterday and the custodial staff for making sure that this place always looks great. So let's thank them real quick. All right, and now for the acknowledgements section. Uh, uh, Maria Luisa for uh, helpful discussions. Uh, and uh, Russell, of course, for helpful discussions and that beautiful song that we had the other day. Uh, Maria Clau for doing the amazing uh, painting of Tony that we gave us the gift yesterday. And Paul and Anne for taking care of the framing of it. 
Uh, of course, I want to thank all of the speakers. Thank you so much for coming out and making this event so great. And to everyone who attended, uh, especially those who were invited and uh, came who I think a lot of us haven't seen in two, three, or many more years. So thanks for coming to make this event like really, really special. And of course, the last thanks goes to Tony for all that you do for the community and for bringing us together. And thank you so much, Ian, for doing the lion's share of work and coming up with cool stuff and being amazing. Thank you. A true Tony student. And thank you to Antonina Kolopolova, our head organizer. In paper. All right. And with that, we are going to conclude the technical part of Tony CS. Uh, so we have now an hour and a half for lunch. And if you want to reconvene here for the hike, then we will see you then. Thanks. I went this morning.